<laughs> Thank you for joining us on Worldwide Slot Car Chat on Zoom. Uh, let's talk slot cars. This is number 95. Let's just get right into it. Anybody got any show and tell they want to show and or tell? John's got his virtual hand up. If you'd like to show and or tell something, anybody else put your virtual hand up and we'll make sure to get to you. Go ahead, John. Okay, well, I, I have something to share that um, I think would be interesting. I, uh, here, let me just show you right here. Um, here is our, uh, our 935 out of the mold in white resin just plain resin and it looks like it was painted it looks fantastic yeah wow. so all the parts are ready I, I tested the uh, clear actually the clear is still in the molds right now i just took the top molds off to see how the clear is doing the clear is doing really well so all the parts are ready to go hey. that's wonderful so there we go now this is just sitting on top of course i didn't glue that in but i just thought i'd show that off but i i'm really very very pleased and i hope you guys will be pleased with it as well i'm super pleased for Mr. Sampson, we have more. Um, I, I'm, oh, I guess Frank isn't here yet. So we'll have to, he'll have to, I guess, catch up in some way, shape or form. So um, let me just get this going for Mr. Sam. I, I did post today, if anyone watches my We YouTube channel. Um, I saw it. You did? Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Well, so there's a bit of a... I'm one of the three that watched your channel. Today. Thank, oh, thank you so much. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I make I, 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 almost a, enough to buy a bag of kitty litter. It's amazing. Um, here is, I, you've seen these photos, I guess, if you saw the video, but uh, this is right out of the mold. I cast it again in, in just white resin. And it looks like, again, there's a couple of little thin spots you can see pink through, but you know, you, you can get away with polishing this and not even having to paint it. You could, you really yeah, could. That's really good. Um, the rear was just, and this is, you see, sorry about the flash, but that's literally how it comes out of the mold, folks. Um, very, very pleased. Very yeah, pleased. Frank's going to be super pleased with that. It looks really nice. That and, looks great. Oh, oh, that's okay. a better photo. That looks fantastic. There you go. So this, these are all the parts. So, you know, just as you had these, just, um, struts with the, oh, the original struts with it yep yep so nice. that's the way i cast them for you i built the mold so you can put metal things through uh there's the rear wing mm -hmm. there's the air box um unfortunately i just haven't had a chance to take out the um uh, injectors yet but but that's 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 all done and that's the glass as it comes out of the mold so you can see the glass there um i'm just let it, it takes longer to cure unfortunately so i don't want to take it out of the lower part of the mold uh, uh, so it, it'll, it'll cure properly but that's that wonderful yeah so I, I hope you don't mind uh dennis i trimmed the actual vacuum form and yeah. then made a mold so that it just that's fine. Sits, the, sits perfect yeah yeah that's wonderful and there's the original there's the original body i see there. that yeah that's yeah. wonderful john it looks it looks magnificent so i wanted to have everything ready for you so i could just do it all in one shipment for you if that's okay the other question I have for you, Dennis, is I do have inserts, I think, that are correct for the car uh, that I can include. Uh, if, if you don't have them, I'd be more than more than pleased to, to send them off to you. The um, other yeah, Frank, Frank may need them. I don't think I need. I think I have lots of Chaparral inserts here. OK, that, that, that's uh, cool. Both, and, yeah. both um, the, the, the slotted ones and the uh, BWA ones. Okay, great. What, what, uh, that, that's, that, that's fantastic. The other question I have is uh, driver, steering wheel, dashboard. Um, I can go around and see what I've got. Um, I, I know the, the best head for this would be, you know, the 132nd scale monogram uh, head that looks just like Jim Hall. Um, so I've got those. If, if you want, I can include that. And then I'd I can love to. Yeah, that. yes, please. Okay, good. And then as far as, uh, let me, give me a, um, I'll have to sort of hunt around for yeah, no driver problem. and proper arms. Yeah, of uh, course. I've got the, sorry, I've got the steering wheel. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I'm just saying yes, of course. Okay. I'm agreeing with everything you're saying, John. Oh, uh, great. Okay. No, no, so, that's fine. Uh, while, you, while you've got me in that condition, you better get going, but we'll yeah. work on it. All right, that's it for me. I'll just press the button and leave now. There we go. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. And, and again, um, it's a lovely body that it, it's got a wee bit of a twist. It, the original had a wee bit. Of, I tried to take it out and it's still a little, a little high here on the front fender than the other, but it, it's, it's fine. So there we go. Is it high because it's twisted or is it high because it's just cast higher than? Uh, the that the original you sent me uh, looked like it had twisted a wee bit. So I tried oh, okay. to untwist it, but it, 
I, when I get the old, it may have re found no. itself. Okay. In the old, but, so it's a wee bit out, but it's not. not Meaning not, if we warm it a little, we could probably twist it straight. Yeah, it, it's not okay. bad. It's out like maybe 30 seconds of an inch. Okay. Yeah. You still know just, what that is. Uh, oh, well, just from the, like the, the one that you sent was probably just from the old resins. Like, you know, no, no, no. Never a 30 second of an inch. I was wondered that was wondering whether you still knew what a 32nd of an inch was. <laughs> I'm trying to say half a millimeter or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I specifically wrote down the um, the metric to imperial conversion just for my audience. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you for sharing, John. Does anybody else have any questions for John before we move on? Seeing and hearing none. Jeremy, what you got to share and show today? All right. Um... A few weeks back, I had talked about magnet marshals and wanting to do something with Arduino. So these are load sensors and you, you plug them into an Arduino and it, it's like a scale. So um, I wanna show you guys the first thing I've got. Let me see if I can share. This screen over here is my first design. Now, I don't have the, the numbers quite right yet. Um, it goes up to, I think one kilogram. I'm not familiar with grams, but that'd be 1000. So in this, let me show you here. This is weighing my hand. So at the top number would be the total weight of the car. And then this number here would be the right tire, left tire, back, front. And then this would be the weight from the half the car and then the back half the car, side and left. Wow. So I, I, I have it working. I just don't have, I'm waiting for a few more parts before I can make like a real working prototype. I can stop sharing now. Um, what, once I get, everything working correctly how I want it to. It's just breadboarded up right now. Then I'll convert it into a, a 3D model where I can I can put all these parts in so it looks prettier. And then once I have that part working, I, I can, I'm gonna get a metal bar with a, a height uh, adjustment on it. And so that way you can kind of take your current magnet marshal. And if you know a car is, you know, 110 grams pulling, you can use this, raise the metal up to 110 grams. And then you can kind of, zero each scale to each each other one so that's what i'm working on all right that's awesome dude thanks yeah and being able to be able to tune it to basically be a magnet marshal as well and right. roughly equivalent to an existing magnet marshal like if there's a club marshal yeah and, and i i just wanted a way to you know it, my, my idea also was to put like a center of gravity right in the middle and have a bubble there that would kind of float to where the center was but that's yeah, it's a little too hard right now. I'll, when I get to that, when I get a little more advanced, I'll get that part working. Well, you could probably do you could probably do uh, ratios, you know, forty sixty and that kind of thing. Something I, I'll come up with something. But like I was just happy to get it this far working with my hand. So my next step is to get it working on a prototype with a car on it and see what what the weights do. Front do back is nice. Ventures Grease One, Jeremy. Yeah, I've got four of these. Uh, these are one individual. Most people okay. want to just there's two right here in this bag, but yeah, uh -huh. you put you put four up, and then each tire has one of its own scales. So Ooh, that's I have a serious one. <laughs> I was gonna say, if you want one of these, raise your virtual. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me get it working, and then I know, but I mean, you've already done a lot of the work. I mean, it's it seems like a sure thing at this point. You're you're just gonna don't say out. that. <laughs> don't say that. You just gotta then, add some details, dude. You're... The, the board only it runs on 3.3 volts or 5 volts, so I'm gonna have it plug into USB to charge, and <laughs> then I'll just use one of those little I can't remember what these are called 18 650 batteries from China. Oh yeah. And you put them in like power packs, but I mean that's four, four volts. Of course he will. <laughs> Tony wants. I'm close. I'm very close. <laughs> Neil wants one. Tony wants one. Mr. Tony, the tool man Petrucci definitely wants one. I do have to think about a background image. Like on that one, you saw there was just a blue screen. I, I'm just thinking maybe just keep it simple and make, you know, four tires yeah. for each, whether each number is. And then you can see, I don't know. I couldn't come up with anything more clever than that, but. It doesn't need to be clever. It just needs to be informative. It just needs to work. Yeah. It just needs to show you the information you want to see. John yeah. wants one. John wants one. The other John wants one. The other John wants one. <laughs> yeah, I gotta be. I gotta be honest. Like building them, building all the parts so far, it's only cost like twenty bucks. So I don't know. Oh, but man. I mean, the, you have to have the you know, be able to program them and get it all ready. But, sure. Yeah. Like I mean, if you were to provide them, you you would have a lot of work to do. You'd you'd have yeah. to put all the 
the things and assemble all the electronics and stuff. But at the same time, if you wanted to, you could say, here's the things that you buy from AliExpress or Amazon or whatever. Mm-hmm. Here's the, here's the, the uh, sketch or whatever it is for the, for the Arduino. And here's the 3D print files. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I, I just, I'll let you know when I get to the next step and then we'll of course. figure it out from there. But... Awesome. Yeah, looking forward to that. Cool. cool. Thanks for sharing that one, Jeremy. You're going to have a bunch of excited people frothing to get that tool when it comes out. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to show and share for show and tell today? Neil, were you raising your hand just to show your support for Jeremy's cool thing? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and everybody else in here wants one of Jeremy's awesome things. So seeing no additional show and tells, I, oh, there we go. Dewan, what you want to show and tell? Don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay. I was wondering if anybody was familiar with uh, this product called uh, Deoxid, D5 and Deoxid uh, 100L. I don't know if you can see these or not. I've seen them. I've never used them. They're they're marketed for the same purposes that Inox is marketed for as a right. antioxidation treatment thing. And I've yeah. seen some guys use them for the same purposes that we use Inox for, and and say that it works great. So it'd be great as a rail cleaner uh, and right. as a braid treatment. Yeah, they they they've uh, advertised as uh, being able to eliminate rust and uh, you know. Uh, get uh, tarnished and rust, as well as increase the uh, electric conductivity. Yep. So that's similar to the Inox, but uh, this is supposed to be a rust elimination thing. I just got it today, so I haven't had a chance to really uh, play around with it, but I'm going to see how well it uh, matches up to my uh, manual techniques and see how well it uh, compares. Yeah, I, I mean, Inox is short for basically, you know, in as in to prevent an oxidation it's a it's a it's a rust preventer as well so i wouldn't be surprised if it, it basically works just as well as inox does the, the real question is are there any um chemicals that might attack plastics well that's what this one this one specifically says uh um or safe on plastics safe on plastics safe on plastics um yeah so I, I, i'm gonna test it out i haven't had a chance to do that i just had never heard of it until i ran across uh Someone that recommended it in an old article from five years ago. Yep. Okay. Yeah, good thing. Thanks for sharing to one. And Bill raised his virtual hand. What's up, Bill? Hey, I've got a quick one. Uh, Just uh, Dewan has kind of brought this to the front front and center and luckily on the right day. Uh, So I'm working on a, uh, you know, just with the different 3D printer type stuff for the uh, slot car track. I'm working on landscape and that sort of thing. I've run across, I'm using uh, Super Gold Plus um, as a glue, and I was primarily going to use that for, for slot car work. Um, now, in this case, the, what, I, what I wanted to do, I got, I got a tire off uh, Thingiverse. I wanted to do basically like a stack of tires. Um, and, and so as a result, I printed these singular tires. Uh, you know, and just kind of made them representative, kind of close to what I'm seeing uh, against my cars. And so I used the the Super Gold Plus. Now, the Super Gold Plus shows as being five to 15 seconds. It says gap filling glue, foam safe, odorless, five to 15 seconds. This, so I glued five of them together. This took much longer than five to 15 seconds. <laughs> So I'm assuming that there's a product out there that I can that I can use that's going to work with PLA plus somewhat better, right? Or is that basically the best I can do without having that, you know, the white fog and all of that that you get from super glue? I've never tried super gold plus, so I don't know know how well it works in comparison to other chemical adhesives. What do you use? Um, For PLA? Well, yeah, for PLA, I'll generally just go with a tried and true super glue or uh, shoe goo, you know, goop type stuff. Okay. Um, it, <laughs> there is a product called 3D Goop, which is specifically targeted towards, you know, PLA adhesion, you know, for the 3D printer market for people who, uh, you know, 
make things out of multiple pieces of PLA and want to glue them together. It's, it's some kind of chemical, uh, you know, chemically softened or, or thinned out PLA of some sort. So it, so once the chemical dissolves, you know, into the air, then it's solidified. I've not tried that, um, but lots of 3D printing enthusiasts, you know, swear by it. And of course it's, you know, advertised on lots of 3D printing, you know, YouTube channels. Um, but I, I generally try to design my things to either print in one piece or to mm -hmm. have some other method that doesn't require the glue to do all the work, like screws or, you know, slots and tabs and dovetails and things like that. Right. There you use the, this, what was it, gold what? Uh, this stuff is called Super Gold Plus. It's primarily used with models and that sort of thing. Um, but it's it's one of those things I had planned on using it for some model model work and and I said well I try it on the PLA plus and the the super glue just using the standard super glue the problem I have with that is if I have it on a black filament it leaves that white fog and so the the super gold plus does not which is why I said well let me try that but it just takes a while now it's fine I I mean I just put clamps on it and you know walked away for a while not a big deal but just kind of when I'm sitting there looking at the label and it says five to 15 seconds, uh, something's not right. So, but it ultimately does glue. So yeah. I think John might have some help for you. Well, I, right. I, it depends on how permanent you want them to adhere or whether you just want them not to move because even something like a, a wood glue would at least hold them together. And then heaven forbid a car hit them, it may come apart, but it will at least be together. I don't know, would that help? It would probably look more accurate with my, uh, with the accidents I have. If the uh, wheels all, if the tires flew on in all directions, um, well, yeah, it might. I'll I'll try the glue as well. Um, you know, just a standard wood glue that that might dissipate enough. Um, hot glue, I I tried, um, but the problem is, is it, it goops out too much, um, and so it shows. What I really wanted to do is essentially, I'm realistically, I'm too cheap for the urethane uh, tire walls. It's just that simple. I'm not paying thirty eight bucks for for a tire wall if I can if I can print it out. I mean, it's yeah. not my fender physically that's getting damaged by that tire wall. So it doesn't matter to me whether this with whether this is hard or soft. So but uh, but I wanted to make them so they're essentially, you know, they're it's nothing fancy, but essentially they're stacked kind of irregularly. So well, uh, yeah, and that's the way they are on racetracks, Bill. So exactly. it looks awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, so we'll see, but getting there. So all right. Well, thank you guys. Well, no, if, if, if it's any help, I mean, um, I, I, I built, um, you know, we put little hay bales around our track mm -hmm. and I don't adhere them. I actually stack them. So when a car goes off, everyone loves it. Yeah. Yeah. I really like those. The, uh, I'll probably have a, a stack of, uh, you know, some, some singles or whatever. And, and I don't know, we'll see. I'm still going back and forth as to whether I made these tires too skinny. Theoretically, I, I pulled up the Google, the Google, um, images you know and looked at the tire sizes on those and how many tires there were proportionally to the to the car next to it and kind of just you know it was kind of a spitball attempt but it seems to be doing okay on my track so and there there you go well and they don't have to be perfect because most of the tires that they use are old you know worn and they're various sizes i mean they yeah. try to be uniform but you know they're truck tires with car tires so yeah no, i think it looks great perfect well, great. Well, thank you. I appreciate your help. And uh, thanks for your info. Are also, you painting or your them? tips on the other stuff. What, what's Are that? You painting your tires? Are you painting them? Oh, no. No, I, I don't do any painting. Oh, in, oh, in terms of in terms of these tires. Sorry, I thought you were talking about the car, like painting with super glue or something. Um, you know, I haven't decided. I just got an airbrush. Um, I'm thinking about it, but I figure I'll probably have to prime it first. And, uh, you know, I'm, this hobby is a great hobby. It sent me in a bunch of different directions, um, whether it's airbrushing or plastering or 3D printing. I mean, there's so many different angles that to go to. And so I'm kind of, you know, it's just, it's like, oh, it's Saturday. What, which angle am I going to attack today? And uh, I'm just slowly getting there. But it's, it's, a, it's a fun hobby overall. So what, one of the things that I was going to suggest is uh, how well a glue works depends on what you're using it with, right? So that glue just might not be ideal for PLA. 
but also how much of the glue you apply. So it's entirely, it's super easy to over apply. It's a lot of glues, you know, especially super glue when it's so liquidy. Um, so, you know, I would suggest before you give up on that particular glue, since you've already got it, do some tests with just the tiniest little smear of glue on the surfaces to try to get them to adhere better, um, you know, or lots of glue. And, and um, somebody else made the suggestion, Mr. Weber made the suggestion of hot glue, you know, and, and, you know, a tiny little dab of hot glue, the clear stuff, you know, it's not going to smoke and it's, and it's, hot glue works on a lot of things you wouldn't expect it to <laughs> that other glues don't work well on. So it's certainly worth a try too. Most of what I ran into with the glue, I just had a gap is kind of the problem I ended up with, but I might, I might not, I might've put on a little too much even then, but on, on the other hand, as you were bringing up, you know, maybe, maybe I'm using too much glue or, or not enough or whatever. Yeah. I'm only using two dots on each tire. Um, now they're relatively, I mean, proportionally are about the size of a, of a, I don't know, a volleyball maybe compared to the tire. Um, but, but, you know, I, I could probably try using more glue too. It might, it might just be that I'm being cheap. I mean, I haven't done a lot of model building either. So, or, or just, or just a thin bead around the entire tire. So wherever touches yeah. touches, yeah, definitely get some adhesion there. And, and like I said, some glues just, as soon as they hit a material, they're not compatible with, they just never cure. Right. So you just end up with partially me melted plastic and non cured glue. And you have to pretty much start from scratch. So, I mean, if that if that doesn't work after the next test, then don't <laughs> bother wasting any more time on that glue. Uh, you know, just as a personal experience, uh, I remember a long time ago, I bought some some used stuff from a guy and it was just, his box was just chock-a-block full of old tires in it. And I tried to glue them together to make a tire wall and no glue I had would ever hold them together for long. I tried... I tried the the rubberized glue, the the two, IC two thousand or whatever it was, the black stuff, that peeled away. You know, su regular super glue, chew goo, just none of them would hold on very long, and I just finally gave up. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm never gonna have real rubber tire tire walls. <laughs> well, well, and I, I, you know, I really find that slamming a car, and I know they're, I know they're supposed to be, you know worshiped vehicles and all of that but they're slamming a car into a wall it's just fun i i try not to do it because i know i ultimately have to pay for it but you know yeah. at the same time i'm just not that much of a purist but i will tell you you know i spent i spent uh weeks printing out shoulder pieces uh if you recall on my track by the way greg um and i really had some issues with with i mean uh, the parts in general were good but i had some trouble but I ended up, um, I, I'm still keeping some of that on my track, but I've actually gone to using your, um, I found your design for the, for the, uh, it reminds me of, of Chewbacca's, um, uh, Chewbacca's, uh, belt or whatever, uh, you know, in Star Wars, but the, the fence that you, you know, that bends, okay, yeah. it's such a cool design. Um, it is yeah it's just really it's a it's a really cool design and i'm integrating it somewhat in here and so thank you for making that too appreciate it and, and bill keep in mind too that you... it goes on the outside by the way <laughs> the car should not be rubbing on the corrugated side of the wall <laughs> how about just sliding the tires over a wooden dowel yeah bluff's got all the classic ideas just put the tires over a dowel and then stick the dowel down but but bill as yeah. far as aesthetics remember this is your track i mean you, you know, you can have an homage to a certain period of time, but hey, you do what you want to do, man. Oh, Good no, mine, mine, I just, once, once I do, you know, kind of share kind of the progress I've got here, what, what mine would be most akin to is a big bad accident of multiple decades um, in which either that or if you, if you got a weed whacker and added all of, all of automotive you know, history and then just turned it on upside down. I mean, it's, well, that, I, that, there's no consistency, no, no class going and, here. And I'm sorry, that guys. Was, that, that was most port before it's, it's current owners. I was going to say, that's what, that's most what port was exactly like that. It was just like a mishmash of patches and whatever needed to be done was done, but nothing was really upgraded. So <clears> it happens all the time on a racetrack. So yeah, though, that's fantastic. Hey, well, Bill, hey, another, man. another idea. Uh, the tire walls that I deal with at all the racetracks in Northern California, full-size tracks, 
they're tied together. So you could take some small twine and just tie them together and you don't have to worry about glue. And it would be theoretically more scale. It would look cool probably uh, when they all blew <laughs> apart too. Yeah. Well, that, You're gonna have to hit them really hard with a, a scale card to blow them apart. But that kind of circles back to something that I wanted to mention that John pointed out, you know, when you, when you crash your car into a stack of hay bales or if it was a stack of tires that they're all individually printed, they make a fantastic mess but then you've got to clean up that mess and restack all those tires and restack all those hay bales and stuff like that, which is a pain in the ass, especially if it's in the middle of race night and you've got a track that's just strewn with all these little things you know, in the middle of a race. You know, It's like, no, get them off of there, get them off of there. But if they were all individually printed tires and you held them together with thin twine or fishing line, for, for that matter, just you know, did the ziggity zag and back. Fishing line is a great idea. And then oh, you, it, you could do real, real thin zip ties too. Yeah, and you could hit, you could actually barrel straight into the wall, and it would absorb some of the impact because it's it's going as a unit, but flexible. The car would, the impact would be partially absorbed, and you would all you'd have to do is straighten out the line of of tied together, and it could be hard plastic. It wouldn't matter if it was hard or, or soft. And it's not like fun stacking twenty HO tires back together. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun at all. Although here's here's one other thing to think about also, Bill, like in real racing, on for, at least with the guys I race with, we used to have wheels off fines. So if you put a wheel off, that was a hundred bucks. And it all went towards the you know the year-end banquet or whatever the hell it was. But that kept you not wanting to go off the track as well. Yeah, that's a little motivation. Doesn't hurt. Maybe just huh. <laughs> or 50 cents or a quarter or 10 cents or, yeah one one thirty second of, of a dollar there you go well, my, my curse jar is getting pretty good in here so but we're getting there <laughs> so, thanks for all the help um the last few months have really been helpful um uh, you know particularly and and um yeah just appreciate it so thank you awesome anybody else got any more ideas for bill before we switch go ahead john I... okay cool uh hey john hi uh I've been looking at that same issue when I when I look on eBay or uh, Carrera slots or something. I'm looking at their their tire walls, you know, it's, it's just outrageous. Anyway, uh, we use these uh, foam knee pads in the garden. You get them at Dollar Tree for you know it's a, it's a some kind of rubber foam rubber. You get them at Dollar Tree for a buck. So at least you used to. I don't know if they make more than that now, but so I. I take those things and I have an ancient old Sears drill press or some kind of old drill press and I found some some uh, bits, a whole set of bits for like ten dollars online and on eBay to cut ceramics with. They're designed to cut glass and ceramics to, to pull a hole. And so I took those that material, put it in the drill press, and found a bit that I felt about right for a 130 seconds go tire wall. So I cut these plugs, little cylinders, out of the foam. And, and, uh, so you can see it's, it's pretty cushy. But uh, yeah. anyway, so you know, you can tie these together, stack them. I hot glue them. Uh, you can stack them as much as you want, cut them in half, if you want to, you know, whatever. And, and what, what are those? At Dollar Store, what are the I, Dollar I'm, Tree or Dollar, Dollar Trees? Tree. Yeah. What uh, What are they? I'm sorry. It's It's a It's a knee pad. It, it has a cutout on one end of it for your hand to slip through. It's a knee pad, like you use it for gardening. Yeah, I, I use them for gardening. Yeah, that's a yeah. That's a great idea. Gotcha. So you know they're dirt cheap. And yeah. If you mess it up, who cares? So anyway, uh, I put some I put some acrylic paint. I just painted some with an acrylic. And of course, you could tie them together with wire, or like the other fellow said, a zip tie, uh, zip locks, I should say, zip ties, uh, wire, string, whatever. And at the racetracks, lots of times, you know, you say, oh, that's painted, that, those don't look like tires. Lots of times they have covers over them. The tires have covers. Those yeah. are old conveyor belts or something like that. They, they, bind them together with right could use duct tape and, and lots of times they put paint on them and stickers you know sponsor stickers and things like that so you know you can you have uh, 
whatever colors you want to put on. I just use the cheap acrylic stuff and slap it on there and glue it together. But uh, I think it's going to work pretty good. I haven't actually put them in, in service yet. That actually that reminds me of a guy That's that cool. was selling um, essentially tire walls. Uh, unfortunately, he passed a year or so ago. But he what he was doing was taking uh, like the pipe insulation stuff that was about the same size as a one thirty second scale tire, and just cutting it into lengths that were about the same as a stack of tires. And then he would do like I don't know fifteen, twelve or fifteen of them, and then he would wrap them all in. Uh, a color of stick-on vinyl, uh, and then he you would he, he would use his vinyl cutting machine like the Cry Cut or Cricut or whatever you want to call it, and he would cut have uh, sponsor logos and, and names and stuff cut out, and then he would stick those on, and so he would sell all these sets of either red and white stripes or Goodyear or you know Blanc, you know all this you know all the various racing sponsors that you would see around a track, and he would sell them in sets. Of those, so that's certainly, and they worked really well because they're nice and squishy, and you could bend them around turns and stuff like that. This Greg, they have some great ones that are in blue and yellow. I have those. <laughs> Fortunately, I got a I got a large set of them. There, most of them are on my track. These are these. This is just one pair that I put together and, and wrapped with some colored. It's almost like duct tape. It's like a really thin duct tape came from the art supplies store. It's way too expensive. But anyway, uh, and just use a sharpie to draw some, some uh, black lines to simulate the. Separate. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you, John. Just an idea. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. On my first track, I used a uh, heater hose or uh, automotive heater hose. Went down to the to the hardware store and bought myself a length of black rubber heater hose and slice that up. I'm just going to share the screen so you can see what they look like. Come on. Wait, no, there we go. There we go. <clears throat> and those are just pieces. I, I took, the, I took the, um, the heater hose and I just cut them into like quarter inch or three eighths of an inch wide and stacked them up on some poles and put them around the track. Good. And that's those are slightly stiffer rubber that has yeah. like some yeah, it's stiffer rubber. Does it have a, a um does it does that kind of hose have um a strand of something going through it to help Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could see it on the edges of the tires here and there. Uh but it didn't seem to worry the didn't seem to worry the uh, the thing much. It looked pretty good. Just trying to see if there's the other oh, the other way. Hang on. This way. A couple of other photos that had some of them in. There you go. Oh, yeah. So that looked pretty nice. Nice and cheap, too. You know, took a lot of time cutting the bloody pieces of hose. That's the <laughs> only thing. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like Bill's got a whole bunch of ideas that he can experiment with now. Anybody else got any ideas for Bill before we move on? So, sorry, Bill. My only idea was that if you build your first wall, you know, six inches or whatever, I don't know if you do any casting or a molding, but you could make your own you know, mold for it mm -hmm. and then use that spray insulation foam. I can't remember what it's, it's like expanding foam. You would use. Uh, yeah, whatever it is. And yeah. just until it fills that thing up, you know, slice off the top, pull it oh, apart yeah. and you have a whole row of, you know, 12 tires. And if you hit it, it's just going to crush the little foamy stuff. It's not going to. Yeah shatter your car and spray you said you had a airbrush so i'd just spray it black and rock and roll. And then you can do whole sections at a time well here I'll, I'll show you for example here's the racetrack that i was on there's there's a whole stack of tires just like you're looking at uh yep. Bill. there you go yep yeah there we go okay cool five tires that's what i'm at yeah and that oh, was at uh, yep there you go so that's most work thank you yeah they it's it's definitely i mean it's a it's all going smoothly. It's just a question of trying to figure out, you know, what way. What I like about these in particular is that it does show the tread on the outside, um, you know, on the outside of the tire, if you look close. Now, the reality is, is nobody's ever going to look that close. Um, so I don't know whether it really matters, but it keeps me busy. So there you go. Don't forget the fight. Hey, John, John Kit, which one, which car were you in on that picture? 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was actually I was actually ahead of the pack. That was that. Oh, you want to see that picture again? Yeah, share that um, up. Never okay. ma- never pass up a chance to brag a little, John. No, I wasn't in this group. What happened? I I had this because um, this guy was actually a former instructor, and I'll show you what he did. Um, he ended up kissing a couple of a uh, couple of um, pylons with his car. So you can see. He, he messed up his wing real good. So if you think yeah. you know, plastic wings on a slot car are expensive, I got one of those hanging over my track, man. So there you go. That, yeah, nice. uh, yeah, it was really good. Is that the one on your hot water heater? No, it isn't. But it, it just shows you what, what can happen. Th- this guy was basically an ex-instructor, and he smashed one. I, had, I, I smashed two. So I beat him. <laughs> but I'm not competitive. <laughs> All right. I think that and I think that question has been answered. Mike, you have your hand up. Are you ready to talk about your thing? Yes. All right, go well, for it. I want want to show that I actually do paint once in a while. Although this according to Tamia is camel yellow. Not. It looks much more like McLaren papaya to me. Yeah, I was going to say I thought I thought it was a McLaren you were doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the blue is uh, the decal. I, the decals that I got is is this for the um, for the Benetton. Benetton, yeah. And it's supposed to be yellow. And and a camel yellow is is great, right? Well, this is not camel yellow. A word to the wise. Have so you to run? Be a camel yellow is papaya. <laughs> Have you run that car yet? Oh yeah, I love it. It's is got it the loud? track record on my track. Are you finding it to be loud? Uh, no, not particularly. I, I have both the NSR and the uh, Scale Auto, and I'm finding the Scale Auto is quite a few decibels louder than anything else I'm running, and I cannot figure out. I've, I've greased the gears. I've softened the tires. I've done everything. I, I've even raised it up a little bit. I don't huh. know what the deal is. Yeah, they, they do have an odd well, odd to me, uh, crown gear in that it's uh, the boss of the crown gear where the the set screw is, is on the outside instead of on the inside where you're accustomed to. And they have a separate piece to retain the side play on it. So you have two set screws in there um, to do that, which is unusual. That's different. I I would suspect it's probably just a a bad crown gear that you've got because this is really quiet. The, the NSR, I've had to change the gears on it three times already. It's, it's mm-hmm. chewed them up. Um, yeah. And they, they were terrible. But, you know, and we, last week we talked somewhat about the, um, the comparison between the NSR and this. And the NSR is, is much slower than this. Right. right. Much harder to handle. Yeah, I, f- I found my scale auto wonderful cars. It's just, they, uh, they sound like they have a, a gasoline engine on them. Oh, well. <laughs> Have you adjusted that rear crown gear on the scale auto? No, but I'm going to now that I uh, hear him talk about that. I'm going to go. It's, it. In my opinion, it's a great design because the gear boss centers everything and then you can adjust the teeth of the crown gear by moving the crown gear in or out. Okay. If you've got it too loose or it's, if it's too far to the left or too far to the right, one, it'll be tight, and two, it'll, it'll, you know, if you have too much play, you'll get noise. Because I've, I've had no problem with that being, being uh, loud at, at all. Okay, good to know. Mike? Yes. You haven't got no man in your cockpit. Oh, he's on his way. <clears throat> Not done mine. Cool. So that is I had to, I had to cut part of the cockpit away to make room for the chip and the wires. Um, Struggle, but I got him in. Yeah. Good job, Tony. Yeah, good job. What'd you do, what'd you do to the body before you painted? Did you, did you do anything to it or? Uh, alcohol and soap and water. Yeah. And the Tamiya lacquer stuff gives it a wonderful finish. It's really nice. I did do a little filing on some of the flash parts of it. Um, it's not perfect, but, you know, I'm a racer, not a modeler. Uh, so am I, but... I've, no, I've never done any painting. I'm waiting for a spray booth to come and some paint, so I'm going to have a go at this. <laughs> I've used a furniture lacquer. There's a tool for everything. On, 
uh, I used a furniture lacquer on my uh, uh, um, scale altos and it came out really nice, real shiny. Any specific brand that you would recommend or? Um, I don't remember the, I'll have, I'll tell you next week. I don't remember. What's it? What's I have to be downstairs tonight because our heater is out. So <laughs> sure. I tried to buy some this morning from per place, but they did. Our supermarket doesn't stock it. Do you remember what kind of lacquer it was? Like, was it for a specific type of wood or was it like a, a specific, like, was it a urethane or a, you know, what kind of? I believe it was a urethane. All right. Was it water soluble, John? Well, you're asking questions I don't know. I'll have to go oh, back okay, and sorry. get the, no, because yeah. No, the reason I ask is I, I tend to really like using uh, future floor polish. Uh, it tends to just do a great job. It's self-leveling. You can put it on. Maybe that's what this was. Maybe yeah. that's what this was. And it has kind of a wood grain on the on the bottle. Uh, yeah, because it's it's, yes. for, it's for floors. Yeah, oh, that's it. That's it. That's exactly it. See, uh, it's an acrylic. It's a it's a liquid yeah. acrylic. Yeah. See, Mike, Mike worked, that's how that's great. how the West was won, man. You draw so fast. <laughs> 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 Yeah, you know, it looks like John. Yeah, I've used two bullets so far. Yeah, future future <laughs> floor polish or pledge with future shine or whatever it's called now. That's that's a well known slot car body finish. And poor John has frozen. Hopefully he's back soon. Yeah, that was a bad final image there. Did you see that? It looked like he was getting sucked into the into the uh, into black hole or something. Yeah, ho hopefully he's he back. got to the he's hopefully back. he got to the aspirin in time. Yeah. There we go. Can you hear us, John? Just nod your head. Okay, good. <laughs> you froze for a little while there. But yeah, Pledge with Future Shine, good stuff. Uh, very popular. So we're just it's kind of- It's cold in Dallas, that's what it's. Yeah, and, the, and it's affecting your internet. <laughs> All right, Jim, what you got today? Oh, I just had a question for Michael. Did you, did you measure the downforce on those two cars between the- uh no i didn't but uh, give me a few minutes and i will okay. well plus the magnet in the in the in the uh, nsr is further forward than the magnet in the scale auto i'm not sure if that's going to make a difference out. both of the magnets are out okay so that doesn't affect it whatsoever i i my findings was that even though the specs on the scale auto motor theoretically are lower because it's got less torque the scale auto motor had more torque more to me, it had more torque on the track than the uh, yeah. NSR motor. I agree. I agree. So it, was, NSR, it was hard to drive on a wood track. Um, well, it's not on mine. I mean, I've got. Uh, you don't have a wood track. <laughs> I, yeah. I think Jim's I've point is that it's probably pulling a few to, grams. Uh, it's probably pulling a few grams to the rails through the motor. Yeah. So the question. I would think so. How much, does, how much do the motors pull between the two cars? That's what I'm going to look up. All right, we'll find that out shortly. Mine was about two tenths lower than my NSR car, but my NSR car is a well-tuned, proven car, and the scale auto was pretty much literally out of the box. So to be two tenths slower, I thought was pretty good. Um, the other issue with the scale auto, there's no place to put lead in that car to tune it. Nope. Um, oh, actually, I, I put 2.7 <clears throat> grams on the front wing. On the front, yeah, but it, yeah. I'm typically typically putting them on the side pods and there's no place you're going to have to cut off the mounts, which I believe are for the suspension to be able to find a flat plane to be able to, to glue some lead on um, yeah. or use tungsten rod. Tungsten rod may fit because there's just a just a little bitty narrow area to put any ballast on that car. So it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge to tune, but I think it's going to be definitely a good car. Yeah. You know, the side pods have the little air duct on the outside, the little gray air ducts on the going in around the side pods. Yeah. You could you could put ballast on the back of those. But there's no room there. There's 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 other there's other pieces there that hold the suspension. He's talking about vertically on the barge boards, I think. Yeah, on the barge boards. Well oh, you come Yeah, come I don't want to go that far forward. I'm trying to put lead towards the back. Oh okay. So so we'll see how it works at uh, Electric Dreams. On the uh, front, on the front wing, there's two grub screws. What are they for? Those are those are to raise or lower the body. There's also two on the back, Is there, and they, and they come installed. 
they actually come installed, whereas NSR, I don't believe they're installed. You have to buy them separate. Yeah. Uh, but there's two in the back, two in the front that will raise and or lower the body uh, if you have clearance issues. The other question I've got as well, there's on the screw, there's a little little red, little orange washer. Is that for the back or the front? I'm not sure which one you're talking about. On the uh, scale auto Formula One car, the when you screw the body, it's for the a, back. Is it for the back? Because when I took the things apart, it, it fell apart. I didn't know where, which where. Oh, it that's went. that's the one I lost. Yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> 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 so it's for the back, right? Thank well, you. the floor is open, so if we have any topics, you guys want to okay. keep going. Okay. There we go, Mike. All right. The measurement for the NSR is 34 grams of downforce, and the measurement for the scale auto is 27. That's a big difference. Yep. And I just checked it twice. So. Uh, but aren't you getting scale, pretty? Close, aren't you getting pretty? What was your difference in lap times, though? You're saying you were getting improvements, but what was the actual difference between the two cars? Um, like half a second. So they're they're roughly equivalent. There's, the the scale auto is significantly uh, faster, sure. and it has less downforce. So yeah, four grams. Be, it it could be that this, the the NSR motor has too much downforce and it's bogging the car down. <laughs> well, that's a possibility. Since I had to, I had to uh, do a little cutting on the floor of it to get the chip in so it would read properly. So the and these are chips in. So and it, they both have slotted chips in them. Yeah. And so I did I did know that you mentioned before, just to my doing this kind of thing, it felt like that scale auto chassis was stiffer. Yes. Yes. Very much so. Other I found that like the, the scale auto was chassis. so easy to drive. It was amazing. It was really, really <clears throat> impressive. And uh, when I first got it, I had a little bit of nose coming out on the on the turns, and I put the I just cut up a, a uh, um, well, I think it's 30 thousandths, is it 30 thousandths? 16 thousandths inch thick lead. Uh, and it weighed uh, two and a half grams, a little over two and a half grams. Put that across the front and that took care of everything. And it was just a rocket after that. So I don't know. It, it, was, I mean, it, it basically just goes to show how many things can have such a big impact on the performance of a car around any given track yeah yeah <laughs> so and the other thing i wanted to to say another reason not, not to change of the thing in testing yeah, one thing at a time yeah one thing at a time yeah yeah um right. i i talked a little bit i suppose maybe this is more for club corner but uh yeah. this week we did we did mag races or magless races on all three races that we had we're on and, the corner now, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Mike. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> there's no, no segue. Just go into it. Exactly. No segue. Just go into it. <laughs> um, and afterwards, the success of the Thunderslot cars with their suspension, which looks like this. You can see the upright there with the black piece above it and the donut in between. Okay. So this is a Thunderslot chassis. And I adapted it to the thunder slot, thunder slot, or pardon me, the thunder slot donuts to the NSR chassis, and it made a three tenths of a second difference, as opposed to having just the NSR springs in it. Hold that chassis up again. Okay. Show the bottom. What's that there running across the pod? That's tape. So the, the only thing I changed was the suspension. So the tape's been on there since the get-go. Right. All right, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not good enough about that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got, you basically okay, have damping just, in, you're damping with the tape. Just to be though. sure, this is not the car that I tried. This one I just changed. Okay. The NSR that I used did not have tape on it. Okay. So, I, yeah, I forgot about that. That this is, this is a 917 chassis, and it's the blue flexible chassis of NSR. Um, which I've sort of found to be a little bit better, but compared, you know, springs or foam, foam is better. 
in in my on my track in my conditions. Um, I have a I have a newbie question. I have a okay. newbie question. Why the tape on the bottom of the car? It damps the movement of the pod. Dennis, you want to take that a limited direction? <laughs> I mean, we don't have Chris here, so I'm thinking Dennis can be more yeah. technical about it. It, it damps sure. the movement of the pod. Exactly what exactly what Mike said. There's no other reason for it. I mean, but why is that good? He's a newbie. Treat him like a newbie. Yeah. Okay. So you you, you obviously want a little bit of movement in the pod uh, to to get rid of some of the vibrations and to make sure that, that everything can twist and and shake a little. Um, it also allows to comp allows the car to compensate for any misalignments in the chassis between the chassis and the pod. But then, very often, uh, if that's you know that that looseness causes some kind of a rattle or a chatter on the track, and the tape just dampens those those movements and takes some of that chatter and rattle out. And it's a it's a very effective way of doing things. Um, it's not often that you see just as little as as small a piece of tape as um, as Mike has on that one. Uh, when you get onto uh, wood tracks and when you get to places where there's a lot of traction, you'll probably find a lot more tape. Um, I've seen cars where the entire bottom of the chassis is just uh, strapping tape from one end to the other or filament tape. Um, you can experiment with different types of tape too. Uh, the filament tape, and there are different types of filament tapes. Uh, you could use medical tape, you can use insulation tape. Uh, I've seen people use masking tape. Uh, duct tape gets too thick, so it's not something that I've seen people use too often. But uh, any of the thin tapes, and um, each one has a different effect. Yeah, just to add something to that. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. The way I tune a car is I want the pod to do this. I don't want it to do this. So the tape limits this, but allows that. So that, that's one of, the, one of the reasons for tuning with tape. And again, it is, it's just dampening. But that's one of the reasons that I use tape that way to limit the fore aft, but allow it to rock. One, another method that Maurizio had shown me uh, at one of Alan's races a few years ago was that he specifically chose the large head uh, NSR tuning screws, the brass screws, to limit the, the fore and aft motion, but allow the vertical motion of the pod. Because the, the large heads barely moved at all in the, in the hole for the pod. It, they only moved up and down. They didn't move sideways or fore and aft. Uh, Garth, did you have you want to chime in on that, or you have something else? Yeah, I have a, a question for Dennis. Okay, um, I just recently uh, ordered some of those uh, uh, chassis or uh, pod uh, mounting screws that have the elastic stop nuts on the top of them. You know, when they yeah, with, and and uh, and you know, I uh, just wondering what the what he thinks of those compared to like using tape. Okay. Um, I, I presume you mean you, you just have a, a, a screw with a, with a nylock nut on the top. Right? Yeah. It's got a nylock nut, nut on the top and it's got a, a, a turned down shaft. So it's a smaller yeah. shaft. Okay. And so then, that's a, that's a nice because a, you don't get, you don't get any thread in the way of uh, the, of the movement. Now, okay. if you're going to use some silicone washers uh, in between, uh, that's probably a good way to do it. Okay. Um, normally with those, <clears throat> uh, a lot of people use the, 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 the smooth shaft uh, screws and nylock nuts when they were allowing a lot of movement on the pods. Um, and maybe 10 years ago, a lot of guys, particularly the guys running the silicone tires, used to have masses of movement on the pod. The pod was absolutely loose and rattly in the car. Um, but I think with the higher grip that we get nowadays from rubber tires, uh, people have gone away from that. And we, we tend to use, uh, have less movement. Um, I still think those, those are nice screws. It's a nice way of doing things. 
Um, but just don't set it up with lots of, with too much movement. And they're still not going to give you any damping unless you've got silicon or urethane washers in between yeah. or unless you have tape underneath. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about doing was putting, you know, some type of a uh -huh. silicone or a foam washer underneath yeah. it so you yeah. get it, you know. Yeah, Mazzetti okay, have them and um, uh, I think there's a couple of others. I'm trying to remember where I got mine or whether I just punched them myself. You got them at uh, Slot Cart Corners, right? Oh, okay. okay. You're talking right. about the one millimeter ones? Yeah, or even thinner. Yeah. Yeah, I've got the five tenths too. That I've got those I get from sale, scale racing. Yeah, and they come from MR Slot Car originally. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you could you you can go to places like um, like McFadden Dale, uh, not McFadden, uh, McMaster Car, and get uh, 30, uh, 32 um, uh, silicone sheet, yeah. and it, it comes with a it comes with a um, the adhesive on one side because uh, it's normally used for that. But you can always uh, I just made a little punch out of some bits of tubing and punch out the punch out the little washers and rub off the rub off the uh, adhesive and then use them in between it works pretty easily yeah right, going from a from a practical standpoint uh using the nylock nut on the top if you want to make an adjustment then you're going to take the body off the car yeah if you use just the standard ones that are captured you don't so i think the the ones with the nut are probably more precise, but that's just a practical tuning thing. You can't really tune it to the track or as easily. Yeah, and you don't want to do a whole lot of tweaking without the body on it because the body changes so much about the performance of the car. And you could probably- yeah, you'd, have to, you'd have to basically take the body off, change the, everything, put the body back on, run it, yeah. come back to the pit, take the body off, yeah. readjust it, Take it back, run it again. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, even Tim's got a very good point there. But even the HO awesome. guys don't do that anymore because the the performance cars, you still got to turn at least one screw to get the body on and off. They're not they're not all running clip on bodies, at least not at the fray and not at yeah. You know, the, yeah the, the other the other thing that that's good about it, I think, is that you could change the durometer of the washer you're using. So uh -huh. you can change the. Uh, you, know, you could use silicone or you could use, you know, some kind of other rubber if you're making your own washers. Yeah. You, know. mm -hmm. you and, can craft them out of uh, urethane. Yeah. And don't, don't rule out craft stores um, because yeah. punches are a plenty at craft stores for various paper crafting things. You could probably just go in there and find a circle punch of whatever diameter you wanted. They can punch through any material up to, you know, a certain thickness and then take your pick of what material you want to you want to experiment with and just punch or or leather punches yeah i've got a bunch of those my leather working stuff yeah leather punches and, and you know random tubes of various sizes thank you anything else to garth awesome hey jim do you want to tell us about those new uh 3d printed resin bodies for ho cars um, I hadn't planned on it, but I can. There are two new, <laughs> two new 3D resin printed bodies for uh, fray style HO cars. Uh, one, uh, if you want to see them, it's on my YouTube channel. I did an introduction video on it. Uh, one is uh, for all out fray cars or what they call fray stu super stock or actual fray cars. Uh, and it's, it's a Remac supercar, which is like two or $3 million electric car. That's theoretically the fastest car in the world. And so that's what it's modeled after, a Remac. Oh, okay. So I've had people say, what is it? It's a Remac. No, yeah. what is it? it? It's a Remac. And uh, so that's what it is. Um, the other one is a Pontiac Trans Am that's a little bit heavier because it's made for skinny tire or nostalgia tire freight cars, which, you know, they run skinnier tires, so they're not as fast, but they look better. Um, and it's, they typically run muscle cars. So this is a Pontiac Trans Am. It looks really good. They're 3D printed. I don't know, I know very little about 3D printing, but I talked to RC Lincoln at Wizard. They're pre 3D resin printed. Yeah, they look good. PLA printed, I guess. Yeah, but I have a resin printer, so I'm familiar with the technology. And, and from the pictures that you showed in your video, which I'm happy to put in the description if you stick it in the 
in the sure. comments there for me to remember. The prints look fantastic. So, you know, and I know the scale of the car. You got one right there? Hold on. Let me spotlight you. Yeah, and you know, resin printing gets some remarkable results, but even the even the high resolution pictures that you show on your video shows that RC and or whoever he's working with, it knows how to do resin printing. So it looks like the quality of those bodies is going to be fantastic. Yeah, it's it's it, there, you know, there's some little imperfections and in, in, in marks in there just like with any resin print, but they're really good. Uh, this thing fits on the body just right out of the box, perfectly flat. Uh, there's little skid things in the front where the body actually touches the chassis. The screw just holds it in, but the body rests on the chassis, which is what you do with a freight car. Um, so that's built in and it's the right height. So it's to me, it's probably the first body that you could actually just take out of the package and screw together and run it and, and get good results. You don't have to lighten it. It's right around two, 2.1 grams. So it's right in the ballpark. So it, it and it's available. One of the problems we have with Frey is a lot of this stuff is built in people's garages and you just can't get it. Greg Davis makes great bodies. I love his bodies, uh, but he's always backlogged just because it's not his vocation. And so some of the other body casters uh, have not been casting much. So to get good quality bodies and it looks like RC has got a product that's going to be a big success. He's got two or three more in the pipeline in terms of uh, different styles of bodies, different cars. Uh, as long as this works out and people will buy them, uh, I think they're priced right. They're 15 bucks with windshield and screws. So yeah, it's, it looks like it's going to be a great product. I was going to say he includes the windshield and the screw and everything. Yeah, I, he didn't send one to me, but uh, when you, just... <laughs> you got a production, so don't complain. Yeah, yeah the, the the Remap that I have is pretty close to being production. The the Dodge, or I keep calling it a Dodge, the Pontiac Trans Am is not. It's a, it's definitely a pre-production. And so it will come with Lexan, a Lexan window and two body screws, which is typical of fray bodies. Yeah, they look fantastic. So it's great to see more options out there for the for the HO, the tuner. Tuner yeah. HO guys. Yeah, I've known RC for quite a while. And yeah, he was at the he was at the fray. Or not yeah, the fray. You, the, the, met him, yeah. The, um, he RC is a wizard RC product was started by his dad. But there is he put this on his website, so this is not a secret. There is a production problem. He had bodies ready to ship. So uh, he's pulled them back and they'll be available soon. Uh, but there's just a slight production problem that he didn't really share with me, but he shared with everybody else. So he, you know, he's not going to put something out that's not going to work. Yeah. So, and, I, and, and, I, and I know he'll stand behind his products. If he ends oh, up yeah. doing something that, that isn't right, he'll make it right. Yeah. And he, he's a little worried about people because these are new to, our, <laughs> to HO racing resin printed bodies that somebody's going to slam one in the wall the first time and break it. Well, when, you, <laughs> when you well, when you slam HO bodies into the wall, they break. Yeah. But he's just afraid that it's a first kind of venture for this that somebody may do it and then put up on the websites or you know the message boards. Oh, these things are fragile. They're no more fragile than any of the other bodies. So yeah. uh, I'm very impressed with the product. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, be sure and, and drop your link in there, and I'll make sure that people can follow that to your to your channel and and watch that video so they can see those wonderful pictures that you shared. So thanks for the uh, impromptu response to my prompting. And if we're uh, on Club Corner, I've got a Club Corner. For yeah, let's do Club there. Corner, and then we'll get to Jeremy, regardless of whatever his topic is. Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> okay, we had a race last week, and uh, it's at Silicon City Speedway in Silicon Valley, California. Right, uh, it's technically in San Jose. And this 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 next video, I hope it'll play. This is for John. When we got there, he was cleaning the track with his BRM Zamboni. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so he ran that around. There's a bunch of crap on the bottom. It's just a piece of tape, I think, on a on just like a wood dowel or something like that. And so um, I'm not going to go into great detail on the race, but here's the, the grids we had. Uh, we ran a combination scale electrics and Carrera GT. Um, well, okay, I'm going to go into detail about this. This yeah. was one of the most satisfying race wins I've ever had. <laughs> the reason being, I didn't have a car for this class. So I borrowed Mike Andrews, who owns the track, one of his cars, and he'd already loaned another car to somebody else. So this was probably the third car in his stable. And so he loaned me that Corvette, and I was able to win the race with it. 
Um, and I'd never driven it before. So a very satisfying win. I don't often, wins or wins or whatever, but this, this one was real satisfying. Barring a used car and uh, beating the track owner with it. Those Corvette, those C6s from Carrera are actually very nice at car. Yeah, this one was, when I looked at it, it was pretty much stock with the rear tires changed, and that, which is kind of the way we run them. So Yeah, they run really well. Is that the uh, one with the front engine? Say that. I'm sorry. Say that again. Was that the one with the front engine? The engines in the front? No, that's no, that's fly. fly. That's a fly. That a fly. Okay. Carrera Electric's the old L88 Corvette's front engine. The Carrera is going to be Carrera is going to be inline, but it's going to be mid to rear, not yeah. front. Uh, we ran uh, slot at Group C as long as I'm sort of talking about myself anyway. The uh, Gunston Porsche now is five for five and wins. Nice. <laughs> and we ran Can-Am. I'm not going to tell you how I did in Can-Am. We had a good group. This is one of the biggest groups we've had. We had 11 people there. Uh, go, back to, go back to Can-Am for a sec. Hold on. Yeah. What's your mix of brands there? Do you got Thunderslot and Slot It? And it looks like there's a Porsche 908 NSR, one Slot It way in the back, the, uh, McLaren, and everything else is Thunderslot. Thunderslot. Oh, no, no, there's one Ford GT, and I assume that's an NSR. I don't Ford know. Ford GT, I think, said so, so Slot It. Yeah, so a 4GT, a McLaren, and a 908, everything else is, is Thunderslot. Okay. Interesting that, the, that on that track that the, um, the Thunderslot Lolas were quicker than the McLarens or the Elvis. Uh, I'm, I'm still waiting to ask about the track. <laughs> it, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure why. It just, uh, I think it's just the setup on the cars that the people have the Lolas is better. But I, I did notice when I was playing with these the other day is the chassis are interchangeable. I are they actually? Because a couple of the guys were talking about that last night, and I'm like, that can't be. But really? The, uh, can you can you see my cursor? Uh, down at the bottom? Yeah, no, right here? No, that's By mine. Blue car? Nope. Well, anyway, when I took the McLaren and tried to put it on the Lola, the only difference that I could see in the chassis was the radiator that that you can see, you know, it's right in the very nose of the car. Mm -hmm. That radiator, that mock radiator is a little taller. So if you just trim it about an eighth of an inch, they fit perfectly. So if and you I don't have, have an average, radiator. so I can't tell you between an Elva, but I have a, a Lola Coupe, a Lola Spider, and a McLaren, and they're all interchangeable. So without body-specific attachments to the chassis, the chassis are identical. Yep. I, wow. I can't see any difference and they do fit perfectly. You know, I, I, in fact, I ran my Lola two weeks in a row and the one week I had the, the coupe body on it. The next week I had the spider body on it. In the catalog, they are separate part numbers, but they seem to fit fine. So I know that Thunderslot was started by a guy who used to engineer for NSR and NSR is well known for fudging some of the scale accuracy of their cars as have they taken some liberal liberties with these cars as well? The, the scale guess. people that I that I hear on the internet say yes, these cars are not scale. Oh, I, no, I, I don't, I don't scale. really care. So yeah, so just as bad and or and or worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that the Lolas are probably reasonably close to scale. Yeah, the uh, the Elvas the Elvas are not. They were tiny, tiny cars. Because the Elva was a tiny car, and the M6 was a pretty small car too. But um, the, yeah, so the Lola, the Lolas are pretty good, but the other two are. Uh, yeah, not and the thing bad. I like about the McLaren over the Lola is that it's easier to put tires under it because the the Lola has a the lip of the wheel well comes down over the tire more than it does on the McLaren. Yeah. So I've I've ordered another McLaren for the race at Electric Dreams in two weeks. Yeah. So. They, they they gave the they gave the M6 a little too much of a cup bottle, like they narrowed yeah. the center of it a little much. Uh, for it to look perfectly good. But the, the point about it, I guess, is that they're instantly recognizable as what they are. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. They, they look that, the, whether they're the, scale or not, that's another yeah. thing. Whether they're scale yeah. or not, they're instantly recognizable as a T70 or an M6 or, a, or an Elva. And, and it, the finish on them is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Interestingly yeah. enough, the, the blue one you see there in front, which is mine, um, somebody put a picture of, of that, that car on Facebook the other day in one of the vintage sites and the guy came on, or the, the person who put the picture on said, you know, here's this, this McLaren and it's got Andretti's name on the side of it because he drove it. The guy came back with it 
that's the car I owned. I bought it after Lola was done with it. And we took the Ford, because you can see it's got a Ford 4-cam Indy engine. It never worked. Yeah. Um, they took that out, put a small black Chevy in it, and they, they're, they're, they're racing it now in vintage events. Hmm. And he sold it later on. So the car is still around, but not in not with that engine in it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a rivet counter, so I'm not going to like be like, oh, it's off by, you know, however many millimeters yeah. or whatever. Like and Dennis was saying, they still look like the cars they're trying to represent. They're not the blobs that we had 30 years ago. So if, if we were rivet counters, we wouldn't be racing these, but these are great. Uh, the NSRF1 is one of the best classes we have. They're quick. They're easy to set up. Uh, they look good. Um, Michael was talking about this. This it, my Lotus there in the front is painted in, in to me a camel yellow, and I think it looks much better than the NSR in just the plain yellow. Um, so that's a repaint. Uh, the the one behind that, the Benetton, is a custom repaint by one of the guys there. And I finally got the in, I've got the interior done on my Lotus. You see the center helmet. It, what uh, Dennis? I forget the brand name of the helmets, but you can get a lot of miniatures. They're they're awesome. I also got the seat belts from. Uh, uh, IndyCal. So if you get look really closely, you can see the seatbelts. Uh, somebody commented on my seatbelts on the face on Facebook page. It says, how did you get the Williams decal on the seatbelts? And I came back, well, that's Willens. That's the name of the seatbelt manufacturer. It's not Williams. So anyway, that's our class. Uh, last class, we had a great group. Uh, Cedric, third from the left there is coming down uh, along with Mike. Mike's in the blue hat with a, with a red shirt. The three of us are coming down to Electric Dreams in two weeks and see what happens. Awesome. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, two weeks already or probably a little more. Three might be. Jeremy, yeah, yeah. you're yeah, winner, the, the 12th, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry, any more on that? Okay, we'll move on to Jeremy. You had your hand up. What's up, Jeremy? Yeah, so when I joined you guys maybe six months ago, I, I had come back from a hiatus. And in those six months till now, in our club, the this Trans Am, we have a Trans Am series where it's box stock. You can only change the tires. And the 70 Camaros just dominate. It's won every race. And it's, yeah. and it's driving me nuts. So we had our first race of the year. And I won the race by two inches. Uh, we had to measure and see who went by. But I did it with this car. Ooh, and really? everybody's wow. a little irritable right now. It's like, how did that happen? Yeah, tell us. Now, how, well, I don't want to give too many secrets away in case my competition is <laughs> watching here. But some tips from Dennis, from Jim, and Chris all kept everything legal, but some of their tips really paid off on this car. So I just wanted to say thanks to you guys. So what I did then was I took that class because we also run a, a stock car class, which has kind of been dominated by like last generation's official scale electric cars, the Taurus, I think maybe, or the side, Sidewinders. But taking the same tips I used, I had three laps ahead of the entire field with this car. And now everybody's irritable because they're like, oh, we got to go out and buy this car now. <laughs> well, you don't have to, but I would highly recommend it. But anyway, thank you guys for getting me that far. Uh, I, I, I was giddy as a schoolgirl. I was like, if we finally beat the 70 Camaro, it's, it's over. But I don't know if I'll ever win a race again, but hopefully. That it just made my day. Thank you guys. That was it. Now do the same stuff to the 70 Camaro. You can put five laps on them. Probably. <laughs> or just try to get away random, from that car. Just I, I pick any random car and do the same things to yeah, them. And they'll, they'll be the same way. I mean, did you tell them about the Zoom chat and say, you know, I'm learning a lot from these guys are really helpful? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I say it's in, their own it's fault. All get better. No. It's their own fault for not watching. Yeah. Jeremy, how big is your track? Well, we raced at Iowa Grapevines. He has a, I think, a 60-foot, 60, 60 four-lane wood track. Uh, it's underneath the winery, and he can only open it up like twice a year when, when it's a slow day at the winery in the winter. So the, the ja On a big track, the javelins can be really good. Yeah. See, I have trouble with the javelin just because, for me, it's, it, it tips a lot in the corners. I don't know why. Maybe it's just the way I've set that up. But it's, it's tall, but it also has yeah. a taller gear ratio in it. So on a big track, sometimes it'll pull that gear. Yes, I'll probably I'll just send you mine, and you can tune it. Sounds good. The javelin Thank is you, an buddy. inline, isn't it? Yes, it is in line with that green motor. But I, I, just, think I just it's the only one. Luck with it. Yeah. Is yeah, it the only, the only one, Dennis? One. It's in line. Yeah. Yeah, it's the only one that I know of yeah, so far. Right until they now, start. Now, 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 Jeremy, don't also don't discount your uh, driving ability either. No, or I'm a hack. I admit it. <laughs> they, you know how every club has that one guy who's just like better than everybody with any car we have that guy that guy ain't me 
But when I beat him, everybody was a little shocked. And so they're going to be all buying that car, I assume, coming up here. So if you see an increase in sales, Dennis, that from Iowa, that may be why. Well, why don't you just sell up, sell, sell them yours? Sell my car. I, I finally won. What are you, John? Stop it. You don't sell off the team after you just win. Thanks, guys. But anyway, all your tips so far have been really good. So it's really helped. I mean, uh, next week we're going to hear from Jeremy about all the tuning things he did to his guy. <laughs> or all the rules that have been changed and banned. <laughs> there you go. That, that's been known to happen. That's what you get for an open open class or whatever. Yeah. The rules start coming into play. Yeah. Speaking of which, I'll do my little club corner real quick. Uh, last, yeah, last week, we finally had our annual meeting, which we hadn't had for EMSA for, since the pandemic started. So I finally convinced everybody to come in early and, you know, p- potentially give up a race day so that we could read through our entire rule book and, and, you know, bring up any points of contention and, and things like that. Most of it stayed the same, but there was one rule that we had from ages ago, which was basically, unless specifically it was in our standard specs. So unless it was written into the spec of the series, that were that was voted on and voted in it was not allowed to glue in bearings and motors and other things that were loose in the car and recently uh there was there was a, a mechanical issue with the car that did not have its ballast properly secured uh so that was that was taken care of on the night you know obviously um, but then that kind of brought up, you know, when we got to this rule, it's like, well, you know, why is this rule in place? Well, it basically harks back to, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we were primarily trying to be, you know, as box stock as possible, like not even tire changes and, you know, to, to, to glue in bearings and motors and things like that was to, you know, I don't know, circumvent <laughs> The, the 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 manufacturing t- you know whatever i wasn't there at the time when that rule was put in there but basically because you know the the ballast we we decided that we needed to add a rule that ballast should be properly secured right to to not have mechanical issues when ballast comes loose when we allow ballast why in the world are we still you know disallowing you know just by default the simple procedure of you know dabbing a tiny little bit of super glue or whatever onto the bushings or bearings or or to, to the motor and stuff like that because that's not a you know we don't want it to become a, a a spend to win club but you know a couple of bucks for a tube of glue of whatever kind so that's not a spend to win that's you know it's taking five minutes to take the body off your car dab a couple of bits of glue here and there and you're good to go so we pretty much completely stripped that rule and rewrote it to say all of these things are allowed unless specifically disallowed in the specifications. So we'll see how that affects racing with cars such as Skelextric and Pioneer and Fly and things like that, because some of the guys are getting old fly car front front motored fly cars and and being all enthusiastic about nominating a series with front motored fly cars. And I don't know about you guys, but if you haven't ever driven a front motored fly car, don't. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but if you have one, you know exactly why anybody who has a front motored fly car, the first thing you're going to do is go around putting glue everywhere. Uh, but of course, then we, you know, on Monday night, <laughs> we had a uh, race at one of the guys and two of his lanes weren't working. And he, he has this, his track lifts up in order to he can park a car under it. He had to raise the track. He was under there looking at the wiring. He's got the DS box. He's got the stop and go boxes from DS and everything. Pretty much a full DS, you know, racing and, and power control system. And he just could not get this stop and go box to give power to two of the four lanes on this track. And we we're checking voltages and amperages and all this stuff. And we finally got to the point where like, okay, well, obviously we're not going to race tonight. You know, we'll race tomorrow night at somebody else's track. And so, you know, most of the guys went home. By the time I got home, there was an email saying he found he found a troubleshooting that basically said, when this happens, 
Turn the voltage down. Okay, so he he did that just to see what would happen, and and he could then hear the relay click in the in the DS stop and go box, and then he turned the voltage back up to what we raced with, and it was fine. So then we raced at his house last night. <laughs> so we raced on. So it was just this. It was just turn the voltage down, and the DS stop and go box just kicked, went back into its normal functioning position. The relay decided to only work at low voltage until it worked and then it would work again at high, at the regular voltage whatever so we raced at his house last night uh, and i posted a video of that uh, earlier today we raced fly racing cars for the iroc uh, the kind with the little spring uh, spring suspended motor pod if you don't have one of those cars seek one out they are fantastic cars even with the stock tires they are they are great cars uh, they come with uh, these were the touring car bodies, so we had Beamers and Alfa Romeos, but they were all They're the touring. Very nice. Yeah, fantastic. Just a pleasure to drive. Why did they stop making those? I have no idea. They probably would have kept in business if they had stuck with that. <laughs> they didn't even. They wouldn't even have had to, because the fly racing kits came with multiple pods and multiple suspensions and just a variety of like. There was like different gear gear ratios and stuff you could do. It didn't even need all that. Just one car with one set of gears, one set of springs, and then sell the sell the other things as optional. They they would have they'd have kicked slot its ass, you know, if they had just kept with that. Yeah, and for some reason or other, the tour the, the touring cars like the Alphas and the BMs uh, are almost better than the the 911 GT1s or the. Um, or the Vipers, they're not quite as good, but the, the um, in my experience anyway, but the, the Alfa Romeo is a wonderful little car. And they're all head and shoulders above pretty much any other fly or electric or or, oh, yeah. or any fixed, you know, generally, you know, toy class fixed motor pod, a non-motor yeah. pod car. Yes. They're just fantastic to drive. Since then, the only thing that they've brought out that have been pretty good are the new, uh, what they call them, uh, competition or something, fly competition where they're putting uh, decent tires and aluminum wheels and decent gears. And they have a 917 that has a, an Olifer uh, 3D printed chassis, angle winder chassis underneath it. That's a really nice little car. Yeah, that's super recent though. That's like in the, yeah. the last year. Yeah, the last year maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't gotten one of those to compare with, but yeah. And if you, if you see, if you go to Pro Tinker Toys or see them on eBay or, you know, some old new stock in some, <laughs> obscure <laughs> retailers stock get, get it them. absolutely yeah. get it. they work really well they're fantastic cars so we had four of them on the track for the iroc race and those were a pleasure to drive uh and then we had our thunder slot series and as you all know thunder slots are fantastic cars and that was pretty much the end of the night i'm done with my Sorry. i'm done Sorry. with my club corner go ahead john no wait uh, i have a question got, oh brand of car was that Okay, so Mr. Weber, what brand of car? So the one we were talking about for a, a good amount of time was Fly, but it was under their racing sub brand. And specifically, if you're if you just search Fly Racing, unfortunately, they also sold a bunch of other non potted cars under the Fly Racing brand. If you're searching for these cars, make sure you check photos of the chassis that show that there's clearly a, a pod in that car. Thank you. And then Mr. Crawley had a question. Well, actually, I've got to boogie out of here because I've got another meeting to go to. This was my first attendance. I have watched you guys live for over a year and gained much knowledge, and it was a lot of fun to be with you tonight, and I'll join you back again. Okay, well, next time I'm going to make you do an introduction because I'd have sworn I'd seen you on here before, but apparently well, I, not. About, about six months ago, I came on for about 30 minutes, and my dog threw up, and I had to leave before I got That's to say anything. Right. So. Okay, no. the next time so, we'll have you do your intro. Yeah, and, and we'll try do it. Not you to, guys take care. I'm doing it. Okay, and try to Go take ahead. your dog off the French model diet. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <John. laughs> All yeah, right. See you next Bye -bye. week, Mr. Crawley. And then I thought I heard Jeremy's voice. I have one question for you, Greg, with your yeah. rules. Do you guys do your rules by committee vote, or do you have a, a dictator who picks all the rules? Yeah. Yeah. I've just always been curious of which better. I always because we do it rules by committee and I hate it because three people decide, oh yeah, this is what we want. And they get rid of the other, what the two other guys want or whatever. But yeah. I'm just wondering if dictatorship rules are better. Like 
I assume Electric Dreams is a dictatorship type, type of rules because it's his, you know, he owns the shop. He's like, here's the rules that'll work for us. I would say that uh, first and foremost with EMSA is our mission statement, which is, you know, that we're that we're generally a box sock club, except for, you know, very minor, you know, changes of tires and, and stuff like that. Um, but also that that our mission is to encourage and support the industry by purchasing new cars as they come out. So, you know, once a new manufacturer or, or a manufacturer comes out with a new line of cars and there's enough for us to have a grid of, you know, a good variety of those cars, we'll, we'll have that as a series and we'll go buy those cars. I like that mission statement. That's kind of a clever idea. And, and another part of that mission statement is that it's more fun to lose by an inch than it is to win by a mile, sure. which, which kind of, you know, it, it informs our overall rule set in that you know, sure, we want people to, to be able to get their car running well, but we don't want people to spend hours and hours and hours doing all kinds of crazy tuning things to try to get their cars to run, you know, a tenth or two tenths better than the other guys. So generally, that's why we're generally a box stock club. And and we do, we do have our rules ch changed by committee. I wasn't at the formation of the club. But I think that mission statement and because because basically EMSA was built off of the, the ashes of PSSRA when they decided to go a different direction. So our rules were basically what PSSRA were, you know, two or three decades ago before I joined in, um, which was basically, you know, to support the industry, you know, box talk, blah, blah, blah. Um, but at this point in time, when we had our our. Uh, club meeting, it was we, we went over the rules and we in the rules specifically, it states that the only people who have any vote at the meeting are people who have been with the club for a year and who have participated in at least 50% of the of the events of the club for the year. So you can't just like join a year ago, come back a year later and, and feel like you have some kind of say in what the club does. And you can't have joined a few months ago and and you know now you now you're at the meeting and feel like you have a say in what the club does and what the direction changes are so we want people to be able to have a say in how the club changes over time but also not just come in and make big changes with no actual um, investment in the club but at the same time each individual series only requires that uh, the voting members be having having participated in a certain number of the last series like so if you came in at the six months mark you came in july let's say and you raced in this you race in every race of that series starting in july you would then have a vote uh, an actual vote for what car we race in the next series right so if you came in and we were running you know thunderslot or whatever and then we came in for a vote for the next series you'd be able to say yeah i don't want to run <laughs> <laughs> so your your vote would count in that, but your your vote isn't going to count at the at the t the club meeting where the rules change and stuff like that. So it's definitely not a dictatorship, but I think that's not only because of our you know our principles that I that I went over, but also because it's a it's we run at a variety of tracks. We don't run at the same track all the time. So whereas you got a club like like Electric Dreams or that's their track. <laughs> You know, then that's their rules. You know, there's not going to be a whole, it, there's not a whole lot of justification for committee rules when it's just the one track, when it's just the yeah. one host. Garth? I, I, I vote just for wanna... dictatorship. You vote for dictatorship. Garth has a dictatorship at his track, which is perfectly reasonable. I think on the Hill Club is also, they run a benevolent dictatorship style rules too. And it works fine. It's just, as long as they the rules are consistent. Far out these days. It's no is it far on out? The hill. Okay. <laughs> I just want to point out that that um, or unpack that statement that it's more fun to win by inches than by miles. Um, Greg, you haven't driven against your best friend, have you? Because there's nothing better than lapping your best friend, no matter where you, or how you're racing. The, the specific statement is it's more fun to lose by an inch than to win by a mile. And yes, while it's fun to win by a mile. Fair enough. The, the actual racing itself is more exciting when there, when there is a possibility of either person winning or losing. 
when when you're laps ahead of a dude, yeah, you can be like, ha, 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 I'm the best guy. I've got the best car. I've got the best driving skill, blah, blah, blah. But there's no challenge. There's no, there, the, like, going into it, pretty much everybody knew that you were going to win the race when you're when you're that far ahead as far as tooting and skill goes. So when you're when you're neck and neck, neck, when you're neck and neck and and one guy's car happens to coast a little bit further, it's like, whoa, I can't believe you won. It makes it more fun, but there's there's something to be said for that silence at the end. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) You're absolutely right. There's something to be said for that. I'm guessing Iceman has something to say on PSSRA or M. So what you got? Yeah, yeah, because you know I I started that club. I we were racing over in West Seattle, and I said to a couple of friends, "Hey, when I get back from my vacation, let's start a club." You know, and we just wanted box stock. But I find very interesting listening to the group here over the last number of months. You know, is all the tuning, which is great, and you know, doing the tires and. Maybe we didn't have that type of equipment when we started the club, but we didn't really want it to be too much tuning. It was more, yeah, box stock and, you know, we're using scale electric controllers, no brakes. And and uh, I always wanted to not have a dictatorship. I wanted to try to get the people, you know, but you can never keep everybody happy, you know, so it was, but we wanted to have input and, you know, so some of the guys said, John, you should, it should just be a dictatorship. Then uh, part of that would have been easy, but it was just nice to get some input when we decided to go with breaks. That was a big deal, you know, and, but it's just, yeah, it's just been interesting hearing about the, the driving skills, but if you can tune your cars a little bit, you know, you can get more out of it. But yeah, I always thought it would be, it was more fun for me to, to win or even come in second or third, fourth, but the clo- the racing was close. So, but um, no, I appreciate listening to the, the, um, the tuning skills, you know, and the parts, they didn't have any of that. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, I enjoyed racing the Ninco cars with the NC1 motor. Oh. I mean, they were, they were pretty slow, but boy, they you had some good racing, you know, those, so that was Ninco classics. Yeah. 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 That was my favorite class, but we can't we can't race them anymore either because they're online on eBay for like seventy to one hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah. Like, Jeez. I miss yeah. those. Yeah. So anyway, that's that was my take on the the club. You know, it was pretty much box box stock. We'd sand the tires a little bit, and that was it. We never changed tires, and you know, there wasn't too much aftermarket stuff though when we first started. So now there's all this great stuff, and it's just been fun to listen to. What, what's going on so that's all i had to say for now yeah, and and you mentioned the whole skill extra controllers and then the whole hubbub with brakes and everything didn't john powers get his nickname of the professor because he was the first to get a professor motor controller that had the knobs on it yep <laughs> yep and that was a big deal you know that it's like holy crap deal. adjustable controller what the heck's that you know it'd be a real fancy upgrade at the time uh-huh. Yeah. The controller. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very true. That's very huh. true, Greg. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and there's still a rule in, in fact, I, I kind of finagled an update to the uh, controller rule for EMSA that was long standing as, you know, you know, a three wire controller, you know, there must not be any external power source of any kind because people would always, you know, guys who were looking for an edge would, you know, figure out ways to hide batteries and controllers and, and do weird things. Uh, so when I had the Slotic controller, which was fairly new when I, when I first got involved, because it has the ability to not activate brakes when it loses power, which is traditionally what a lot of electronics controllers do is for whatever reason, the brakes kick in when they're, when they lose power. I would always get these long coasts at the end of the race because the, there would be no brakes, so the car would just keep going and it'd be like, "Oh, he's got that battery in there." Anyway, I got tired of that joke <laughs> super fast, but it's that joke still stands today. And I I wrote a rule into the rule book that says, you know, slotted SCP controller, you know, does not have batteries. <laughs> <laughs> that's it doesn't make any difference. They still they still whip out the old that's got a battery in it. I thought yeah. you were going to say that you'd wrote, written in a rule that says you can't you can no longer bust 
make Plus that joke. Greg's chops for the battery. <laughs> now everybody's got their but everybody's got their chop busting thing that they whip out, and, and the battery in the controller is what everybody whips out on me. And uh, but if you want the car to coast, you must just make sure that you keep your keep your finger punched when the power goes off. That's all. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's hard to remember because you know you're like well, you're naturally let go of the trigger. Nah. You know when the when the thing yeah but yeah. I, I actually won a race that way, a 24 scale race, you know, three minutes a lane, 24 minutes. We're neck and neck. Power goes off. I pull, I hear the relay click. I pull the controller and I coast by him. Nice. Mm -hmm. One of the most, I, I remember that race to this day. I'm sure that was an upset. <laughs> I lost the race that way. <laughs> Maybe that yeah. was the only race I've ever been in first position at the end. And I got the guy coasted by me. I was devastated. And then on top of that, he decided, oh, I don't feel like running the A main now. It was a oh, B main win. And he God. said, oh, I don't want to run the A main. Well, can I do it then? No, that's the rule. <laughs> I'm no, I've lost a race that way, that. too. I've lost a race that way, too, when I look, I heard his car go off. And I'm like, so squeeze the trigger, because I know he's gonna, about to hit the button. But he didn't hit the button. And then I went flying, and then I had to hit the button. And I was like, I was, I was like, why are you not hitting your button? Well, Count your chickens before they're hatched, eh? I did. I could have sworn. I was like, oh, he has to hit the button now. No. But, um, in South Africa, on the, on the tracks there, we had uh, we had the relays in the tracks uh, wired in such a way that when you cut the power to the track, it automatically applied the brakes across all the wheel, across all the, the lanes. And uh, that stops the cars very quickly. Uh, you didn't get any kind of coasting because some of those tracks, you know, we were running um, really, really fast cars at the time. And if you would let them coast like that, you could, you could come in, you could pick up some pretty serious damage. So we actually had it wired into the, into the circuits. You had to use a double pull, double throw relay for it, but you could do it. Good stuff. Fun, fun, fun. Mike's got his hand. Everybody up. changing yep. their backgrounds tonight. Uh, <laughs> John's there. been going background wild <laughs> over some there. Kind of, there's some kind of competition between the two Johns, between Kit and Weber here. Is that what's happening? Uh, they're going crazy to see who's got <laughs> who's got the most chaparral backgrounds. I'm gonna have to and watch. Even, that. Uh, oh, Jim's got a Jim's got a P34 behind him now too. Huh? Okay. Ooh, ooh, I like that one better. Oh, and now he's got chaparrals behind him. Okay. <laughs> scrolling through well, his pictures to uh um to the point on competition we ran three races last monday and we all finished on the same lap uh one one of the three of us won two and it wasn't me uh <laughs> and uh and two races were won by six inches so this is after 95 laps with pit stops every 25. So it was close. It was really close. But you know, on, on the benevolent dictator thing, that's me, because I set up all the cars because they don't want to do it for all the uh, all the messing around because I'm playing with Maglis now. Um, so I set up all the cars so it stands to reason that you know they would be close. And uh, but yeah, it's really much more fun when you have really, really close racing. And I'll tell you, it's nail biting because like in the, in the one that I won, you know, I six inches and, and I really had to control you, myself as far as not flying off because I was nervous. I really had to think about it, especially because I was running towards the end of my fuel at the end of the race. So the power is more, so you got to be much more careful at that time, but yeah, it was nail biting. All three races were nail biting. It was really fun. So when you set up all the cars, do they get to pick the cars first and you get the last choice? We do a blind choice. Mm -hmm. um, what we what we do is one guy will hold the three cars behind a car and one of the other guys that is not doesn't know which is which will pick for him. And then we shake dice to see who picks next. And uh, so it's random. It's totally random. So it's uh, yeah, it's it works out pretty well. We run almost almost all our races that way that they're all my cars. I'm starting to get them into the, I've, um, I've actually given them old cars that I, I don't like deliveries on now um, that I 
uh, a group C's I just started. I gave them each a, a body and chassis, and they're going to start playing with it. But they still want to give it to me to set up because they don't know. And yet these guys are experienced 124th racers. It sounds like a dictatorship to me. It is. It is. <laughs> but it's benevolent because I want the racing to be fun. I want them to come back because if they go away, I don't have everybody to race with. You know, and uh, you can only race with ghost cars so long <laughs> before it starts yeah. to get boring. And not even very long with ghost cars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea is to is to keep people enthusiastic and, and feeling like they have a chance. You know, if they're if they feel like they're going to lose every time, they're not going to want to come back. Well, that's what happens in the 124th that the, the, the other guys race is that there's two guys that are always competing for the a, a main win. Um, the one guy that I race with has a habit of qualifying poorly every time winning the B main and then winning the A main after that even, but um, you know, he's a, he's a good driver. Um, so that, that helps, but yeah, it, it gets kind of, uh, you get kind of despaired after a while. It's like, okay, if you're not a good shoe, which I'm not, um, I, I fully admit that, that I'm not the best with, with my uh, hand eye coordination. Um, it it's a little a little despairing to to keep racing all the time and know that you're going to be in the B main no matter what, and uh, you know there's no effort on the rest of the club members to try and equalize it. So you know, and we're spending a lot of money on these cars. The cars are you know 125 to 130 bucks plus the controllers 350 to 400 bucks. You know, it's not cheap stuff. The motors are 35 dollars. I was going to say that's um, the low end. <laughs> yeah. But it's still low end. But you know, just to say though, it's not it's not quite as low end as some of the some of these that were even the expensive ones here. The most expensive one is about a hundred bucks. Um, so, you know, it's it's a it's a different story, and yeah. it, the racing is just different. At least there's strategy involved in in our in the digital racing that I see, and um, I can play around. I say, well, tonight we're going to do King of the Hill, or we're going to do I. I rock, we're going to switch so everybody gets to use the cars or we're going to do magnet cars and go fast tonight. You know, so there's enough variation in the cars that I've got and the people that I run with um, that we can, we can do that. When we had the mag cars, it was pretty much the way it goes. The, the, the fastest guy won uh, frequently, even with pit stops and stuff, it was much easier to, to drive hard and fast. There were a lot more crashes and they were more severe, but um, it was it was still fun. We could we could have really close racing that way because the magnets took a lot of the driving out of it. Now the driving is back in it and the guys are getting better and it's becoming even more competitive besides. So I really enjoy it. And that's the point. But I enjoy the tuning aspect of it and finding out which way to make them faster. But then I do it to all three cars. <laughs> I mean that's what that's what we that's one of the reasons that we do an IROC every night is to is to you know make sure that they're that everybody has the same chance to win because it's all about the driving and not about the car tuning. Mm -hmm. But it also lets you know the, the, the IROC set could be anything. You know if you if you set up four cars that you want to race as an IROC do it and bring them and then you know if, if the host doesn't have a set that he thinks is better then he'll probably pick your set <laughs> and your cars are going to be raced on IROC. That's basically what happened last night is those fly cars were brought in by one of the other guys. And oh, really? the host yeah. didn't have, you know, the host basically only has one IROC set and we always race that same set, which, you know, we kind of got you know bored of that racing those same cars. So, you know, he's, he was just as enthusiastic about putting those brought in cars on his track as everybody else was. That's cool. So, yeah, you know. So what we're what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have the the Group C class as a as an open class for any car they want to run. Um, if they decide they want to invest in more different cars, if they see that one's better or the other, that's fine. But they've at least got a car that they can run every time we have that that group uh, that grouping there, and they're all inline slotted, so it makes it simple. And you know, I'm I'm not worried too much about you know rules like you know, what magnets are in there or whatever, uh, as long as we, we don't have a clear dominance every time. 
Um, and that's that's not what I'm looking for. And if we do, I change the rules to to make a balance of performance change, and it works. Sometimes it works against me. <laughs> exactly, and they're probably they're probably more uh, trusting of the rules when you're not winning every time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff. We got about ten minutes before we hit the stop button. Anybody else got anything they want to bring up or talk about or or ask about? John and John want to have more background battles. What do you got, Jeremy? I have one question. Uh, do you guys remember these old inline NASCAR chassis? Uh, they were inline. They had like the weird tabs here that you you spring loaded. Yeah. If I wanted to put, we we're racing a new class at another track, and the guy said, eh, "Pretty much anything goes." We, if I want to change to a wood guide, should I should I use those springs for like the spring effect, or should I just get rid of pull those things out of there and put like maybe because there's get like rid a of them. just get rid of them. Get rid of them. All right. Just curious. Yeah. And uh, you know, use whatever spacers or whatever you need to make yeah. sure that the guy. Yeah, you don't out. want you don't want anything that's going to lift the front of the car quite a bit. Okay. And do, it's got a lot of slop in there. Should I try to look for something to? Yep. Okay. Try and find a find a piece of tubing or something to get rid of that. Okay. Piece of you know some some cellophane tape or you know scotch tape on the shaft of the guide or you know if it's it depends on how much play you got you know you can't always yeah. use tubing if it's very little and you know make sure that you have your spacers set right and that you know you have the guide post the exact right height based on the spacers under it so there's no up and down motion of the guide shaft and all right that's right all in all your normal guide things yeah i would <laughs> yes those things yeah 20, 24 those scale things. racers go to extraordinary lengths to get the guide perfectly free with zero movement zero slop okay yeah. all right Open yeah, rotational movement yeah uh let me share something real quick Look, here's here's the track we raced on. Did that come up? Let's see. Uh, that's the wood track we raced on. Yep. Okay. So I don't know how many feet that I think it was like sixty eight or something is what I was told. Yeah, yeah it looks like about sixty sixty yep. or seventy ish. Yeah. Uh, I, I like I, the little late show uh, sort of set up in the middle. That's so cool. Yeah, the little... guy said that was from his childhood, so he just threw it up there. He's got his childhood lion elk set too. Chi yeah. So good time. Nice track. That does look like a nice track. Mm. I forgot that I was trying to ask Jim earlier that when you were showing those pictures of of all those cars you guys raced, do you, do you know who made that track? Does that look like a manufactured track, like a Brad's track or something? It it is a manufactured track, and and I can ask Mike, but I'm not sure if he even knows who built it. But it is a manu. I know it's not Brad's, but uh, it, it is a manufactured track. He, he got it from somebody else who got it from <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> it looked like a nice track obviously it, it raced nice so oh now now dennis is in the background game yeah well so is jim yeah everybody's in it now yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's the the latest one tonight well i i was for, at first inspired by dewan i was trying to match him but i i ran out of steam you don't want to just go ahead and share that picture of you talking to but i assume that was burt ward or somebody that you were talking to it looked like somebody was in a robin costume but maybe i <laughs> i saw i saw a background way oh, earlier yeah, no, actually actually it's a it's a production still from uh from the batman show there you go i thought that was you in the foreground no no not quite although yeah i guess i could pass for i don't know adam west burt ward i don't think so not Bert. <laughs> Not Bert <Warren. laughs> Who's the guy? In the, is that Adam West in the blue shirt? Yeah, you see, there's the camera. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna spotlight you so I can get a bigger picture here. Okay, that's fine. See, there's. there's oh, okay, the, yeah. It's smaller, I couldn't tell that that was Adam West. Yeah, and, and you can see he's got the cowl off. Yeah, it's, it's really professors cool. over there on the right. Uh, yeah, look at look at this guy. I mean, uh, the skipper, who, skipper. That that <laughs> this is he was obviously somebody's agent. <laughs> that's awesome. Isn't that great. And they're holding up, of course. Look, look what Bert Ward's holding the bat phone. <laughs> Hold this bat phone, Robin. He didn't even then, he didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like we might be able to go ahead and hit the stop button, and you guys can just chat casually. Is there anything else anybody wants to ask or bring up before we stop the recording? 
not seeing anybody just jumping up and down waiting. So I'm going to go ahead and hit stop, and then you guys can just chat. This, this in, the, the picture that I have in the background right now okay. is uh, the Chaparral Museum, or not the, before the Chaparral Museum. And my friend Ken Jones, who's a slot car racer and an RC racer in the purple shirt, uh, knows Jim Hall. So he went down there about 10 years ago and Jim gave him a tour of the whole thing. And you can see the three cars there. Uh, they're all there, just not in this picture. And he wrote an article for me and it's going to be going into the next uh, Victory Lane magazine about his trip to visit Jim Hall. And he got to sit in all the cars, got to drive around Rattlesnake Raceway. So it's going to be, it's going to be a fun story. And uh, he called Jim Hall a couple of weeks ago and said, I want to write this, this story for a friend of mine for a magazine. Is it okay if I do it? And Jim said, fine. And so it's got Jim Hall's seal approval. And uh, it said all the cars were there before the museum existed. So they were getting them ready to put in the museum at that time. So it'll be an interesting story. I'll, I'll let you know when that comes out. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, very cool. Looking forward to that. All right. So on that note, we're going to hit and hit the stop button and come to a live chat in the future. Bye.